So let's continue studying physics and talk a little bit about momentum. And the first thing we're going to talk about is momentum when we're moving in a line. So this is going to be linear momentum. And the letter we use for momentum is going to be P, so linear P. Linear momentum has an equation. Uh, it's defined as P is equal to your mass times your velocity. So M, something we've studied already, is mass, and V is going to be your velocity. So your speed and what direction that speed is going. And you combine those two, multiply those two together, and you get your momentum. Now the units of momentum are going to be equal to the units of mass, which are kilograms, times the units of velocity, which are meters per second. But we can also think about this in terms of something that we've already studied, something called force. And we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. F equals ma, this is Newton's second law. But we also know from the very beginning of physics that acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. So that should look familiar to this change in velocity right here. Okay, so we have a velocity there, a velocity here, that's also related to acceleration. And we know that acceleration is related to force uh, by the mass. And we also have the mass in our momentum equation. So there are some uh, corollaries we can draw. We can kind of set these things equal and do some substituting. So F is equal to mass times acceleration. But I can replace the acceleration with the definition of what acceleration is. Force is equal to mass times a change in velocity over a change in time. All I've done is substituted my velocity into my a to plug it in right down here. But I know change in v, uh, mass times change in v, is the definition of momentum. Okay, so this gives me a new equation where f is equal to change in p which comes from my mass times my velocity, all divided by my change in time. So all I did here was substitute my mv uh, uh, for my p for my mv to get what my force is. So my force uh, is equal to a change in momentum over a change in time. So I can reshuffle Newton's laws a little bit, and I can solve this for delta p. So I solve this for delta P by multiplying both sides by delta T. That moves my delta T over to the other side. And we get F times change in T equals a change in P. And this change in P has a specific definition. This is called the impulse. And it's the change in momentum. And you need to remember that this delta, this uh, triangle right here, is a delta. So that stands for P final minus some P initial will be equal to F times delta T. So our change in momentum is a force uh, times the change in time over which you have that momentum. Now when I don't have any external forces, so as long as uh, the external force F external is equal to zero, that means that my momentum is conserved. P is conserved, much like energy is often conserved. So what that means is that my P final is equal to my P initial. So whatever momentum I have at the beginning of something is equal to whatever momentum I have on, uh, in a final situation. This works for individual particles and it works for systems of particles. So this makes it very useful for actually solving problems. And in particular, it's useful in solving problems related to collisions. And to understand collisions, we need to realize that there are two types of these. Two types of collisions. The first type is going to be called elastic. And in an elastic collision, we conserve momentum. So P initial equals P final. And we conserve kinetic energy. So in an elastic collision, P initial is equal to P final. And K initial is equal to K final. This is different than the second type of collision called an inelastic collision. In an inelastic collision, as long as you have no f external forces acting, then your P is conserved. The P initial is equal to P final, 
but not the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is not conserved. There's a special subclass of inelastic collisions called perfectly inelastic. And in a perfectly inelastic collision, you have two things that collide and they stick together after they collide. So how can we actually use these? Uh, how can we apply this kind of stuff in actual problems? Well, when we have collisions, uh, we can have collisions in one dimension. Uh, and in 1D, you just conserve momentum. P initial is equal to P final. But quite often when you have a collision, it doesn't just happen in one dimension, it can happen in two dimensions. So it can happen in uh, maybe the X and the Y axis. And when this happens, you actually need to break um, the momentum into the X and Y directions. So this is similar to what you do with a projectile problem. X and Y directions are both conserved, but they're conserved independently. So when, if you have a collision that happens in two dimensions, so let's say I have a particle that comes in and it smacks into another particle that's sitting at rest, so this is the initial situation. And they're going to collide and go flying off. Uh, so we've got our one particle and my second particle. And they collide. And each of these two particles then skids off at some kind of angle. So now these are colliding in two dimensions. What I would need to do here is break these into their components, whatever's going on in the x and y directions. and conserve individually in each of these directions. Okay, so we conserve in respective directions. The same thing we have to do with forces, same thing we have to do with um, projectiles. Everything that happens in the x direction stays in the x direction. Everything that happens in the y direction stays in the y direction. We need to make sure that we keep this in mind. The last kind of big concept of momentum that we want to learn is momentum and how it plays into rockets. And we need a little bit of review. We need to review Newton's second, Newton's third law. So in Newton's third law, we should remember that every force has a force that's equal and opposite. Okay, forces um, have equal and opposite forces. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So we can derive an equation and, and you can find this in various books, but we can derive an equation for the acceleration of a rocket that's equal to V sub E divided by M times change in M over change in T minus g. This g is something that we know. g is the acceleration due to gravity. So that's how fast your rocket is being pulled back down towards Earth. That's the acceleration that Earth is uh, imparting to pull the rocket back down. But we need to break this acceleration. We need to break this, um, this uh, force due to gravity. So m is going to be the mass of your rocket. Delta M is going to be the mass of the ejected gas. So if we look at how a rocket actually works, a rocket uses something called thrust. I'm going to draw a little rocket over here, and it's going to launch itself upwards. It's going to fly up, and it's flying up because of Newton's third law. It's taking a whole bunch of gas, and it's spitting it out the back end. That gas applies a force down. So the um, air that this gas, that this thrust pushes against, 
applies an equal and opposite force right back up, according to Newton's third law. So this gas right here coming out the back is really the important part of your rocket. That's providing some acceleration, some force. And the force that it's applying is actually just a momentum. So the momentum of that ejected gas is the mass of the ejected gas times VE, which is the exhaust velocity. So that's the velocity that this gas is coming out. So this is how this is all related to our acceleration. It's the exhaust gas velocity. Okay, so this VE times this delta M, you can think of that as the exhaust momentum. And that exhaust momentum is the force that you're getting. Okay, because we divide it by the change in T, which is the time that this exhaust uh, gas is being ejected. So this is the time to eject the gas. Okay. Something that strange that happens, something we have to keep into account uh, as this launcher rocks up, uh, this gas that's coming out is decreasing the mass of the rocket because the mass of the rocket initially includes the mass of the exa exhaust gas. So as we're kind of solving rocket problems, we need to keep in mind that mass is gonna change. Mass is gonna decrease the mass of the rocket is going to decrease by amount delta m, which is the mass of the gas that you're ejecting out of the back. So we can see from this a few conclusions, a few concepts for rockets. So from this rocket equation, acceleration equals VE, the exhaust gas velocity, divided by mass, the mass of the rocket, times delta M, the mass of the exhaust gas, times delta T minus G. We can see from this a few things. We can see that if a rocket is a low mass rocket, low mass rocket, is this rocket gonna go fast or slow? Well, since low mass, and the denominator implies a small denominator. If you divide by a small denominator, you get a bigger number. So you're gonna get high acceleration. So we can conceptually figure out what happens uh, to this rocket, how fast it can go based on these kinds of um, analyses, just thinking about what these variables do. Other ways I can change things, I can have a fast gas expulsion. So if V of the emission, the speed, the velocity that I'm spitting gas out of the end of this rocket, if this VE is high, then my VE I see is in the numerator. So if that's a big number, then I'm gonna get a big acceleration. So a high emission velocity for the gas, if I spit gas out of the back end very quickly, then I'm gonna have as high acceleration. And this makes conceptual sense. So we can think about this equation conceptually or in equation form. So those are the two big points to keep in mind. A high VE leads to a high acceleration and a low mass rocket leads to a high acceleration. And the challenging part with rocketry is to get a high VE is very tough. You have to spit this gas out very quickly. So it has to be very explosive. So that makes rockets a little bit dangerous. And also it's very tough to build a strong rocket that's a low mass. So strong rocket, plus low mass is tough to do. Uh, to build up strength, you need, you need a lot of material. So you have to come up with new kinds of physics, new kinds of um, uh, materials to build your rockets from. So that is momentum kind of in a nutshell.